Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am your host, Liv, here with another attempt at an episode while I recover from an annoyingly long bout of COVID. Fortunately, I had recorded a bunch of conversations before this ever happened, so Fridays are a real savior. Today's episode is with a favorite Elodie Harper, who is the author of the Wolf Den trilogy and generally one of the loveliest people I have ever had the pleasure of speaking to, which is why I bring her back with every book, despite the fact that her books are about Roman history and not mythology. But you know what? We always find a way of talking about mythology, and I love it because I get insights into Rome and Roman culture in a way that I wouldn't otherwise, because I never go looking for Roman culture on my own. I need other people to explain it to me. And this is a great example of that. We had an amazing time talking about the final bit of Amara, the main character's saga, uh, living in Pompeii. And of course, you know, anyone who has read the first two, you will know the timeline syncs up to a certain event in Pompeii that, you know, is kind of famous. It was the time the volcano blew off and Pompeii ended and became frozen in time in I'm a big I'm fascinated by natural disasters very much ones you know in the past where no lo- no one is is still suffering um but I I do find them just viscerally interesting and I kind of want to talk about them all the time so we talk a lot about Vesuvius but what's so interesting when discussing Vesuvius and, you know, when it, when it went off and what happened to Pompeii is all the records that exist around, you know, how an ancient people cope with that, what they do and do not understand, uh, rebuilding projects, humanitarian projects, generally just that stuff, you know, that's it happened 2000 years ago and we have information on it. Um, and of course, Elodie is like the queen of research. So she shares all of that. I'm not going to give it all away, but we had a great chat. Um, You definitely don't have to have read the books uh, to listen to this. It's really a fascinating look at Rome and the Roman Empire in 79 CE and kind of everything that was happening and how that revolves around this main character, Amara. But frankly, in this case, it's also just that time period in that area. Utterly fascinating. Conversations, Writing Rome During Vesuvius, The Temple of Fortuna with Elodie Harper. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm just so excited about this book. I absolutely love the series and I'm I love volcanoes, so I also have been so excited that we're finally getting to, you know, the most famous thing about Pompeii, which is Vesuvius going off. Um, But so this one's called the Temple of Fortuna, which is obviously mythological. And thus, like, let's start there. So I don't know nearly enough about Roman traditions or their like, you know, their mythological and cultural practices around that. So do you want to tell me a little bit about Fortuna? And yeah. Yeah. So um, Fortuna is uh, she, she's quite an ambiguous goddess, um, really. So um, she has many guises uh, in, in in ancient Rome, and she can, she's able to bestow great wealth, power, happiness, but also to take everything away. Um, so she's Pliny refers to her as the most powerful of the gods. So Pliny the Elder is a character in my books, um, obviously a real Roman author. Um, and in his natural history, he talks quite a lot about Fortuna. Um, and, you know, he says she's more powerful than God. 
uh, that nothing in life is certain but uncertainty um, and this idea that when you're at your happiness, happiest, something terrible might happen, but also conversely, when terrible things are happening, suddenly it could all be reversed and you could be back on top of the world. Um, and that's really the guise in which she appears uh, in, in my book. It's, I quote Pliny quite a lot and what he talks about with the goddess. It's, She's not a comforting figure at all. People pray to her, um, they want her to bless their lives, but there's always this understanding that she could take everything away just as easily. Um, her symbols that she held, one of them is a cornucopia. And in fact, in Pompeii, there's the Via Abondanza, is the modern name of it. It's based on a well um, with a woman's face with a cornucopia, who who could in fact um, be Fortuna, um, although the, the, the street's not named <laughs> Via Fortuna. Um, and so, yeah, the cornucopia is what you wanted from her. That's her gifts that she can bestow. Um, she also sometimes was represented with a rudder um, because she sort of steers your course through life. More, sort of later her symbol of a wheel became more and more famous as, as time went on that wasn't the dominant image in the Roman era but it, it certainly was one um, this idea that you know fortune turns her wheel when you're at the top that's great but it keeps spinning you end up in the bottom you might go up the top again so it's really this sense of chance of uncertainty and that for me was kind of perfect in terms of writing about the eruption of Vesuvius, um, which in many ways shows the power of Fortuna to do something um, so unexpected in which everybody's fortunes get reversed, upended, uh, there's this sort of change in flux. And also um, the, the temple in the title is actually not just one temple. I don't want to do spoilers about how many temples, but at least <laughs> at least two are real places so there's the Temple of Fortuna in Rome, um, which st survives partially in the um, Lago de Argentina. Uh, it's, it's a circular building. I find it kind of fascinating because Pompey's theatre was just behind this temple, just by it. And Julius Caesar was a huge sort of um, admirer, an acolyte of fortune, you know, the whole, whole idea of fortune favors the brave. He he saw her as kind of blessing his his life, and yet he was murdered on her doorstep, um, which just shows that she was not a goddess. And, and I mean, none of the ancient gods were really kind of cuddly, but you know, she was not a goddess who could be relied upon at all. So that's the first temple in the book, um, and that goddess actually survives her cult statue. There's her head, her arm, her foot at a museum in Rome, the um, Centrale Montemartini. And um, she's a very forbidding figure. Um, when Amara sees her, she, she thinks the cornucopia almost looks like a weapon. Um, and she's massive. She would have towered over people. Uh, and then there's a temple um, to Fortuna in Pompeii, which was built by a relative of Cicero. Um, you know, and that's uh, the Temple of Fortuna Augusta. So it's, it's, the goddess of fortune in a different guise and it was also a means of sort of worshipping the imperial family it's almost a kind of political quite pragmatic temple in many ways um and quite suitable for Amara to be honest because she's somebody who kind of plays the game as it were to try and and improve her fortunes throughout the series yeah that's okay. so that's really generally really interesting, but it just makes me think of so one thing that's been coming up for me lately is realizing how little I know about Rome, like as a culture, you know, like I have a decent knowledge of history and all of that, and obviously like the names of their gods, but they handled the worship of their gods and they thought of their gods so differently from the Greeks that I've just never gotten a real handle on it, and it feels to me that like like everything you've just been saying about Fortuna, it feels, I mean, obviously she has these like specific aspects because of what she's the goddess of, but it feels to me like all of their gods are just a little bit more like 
conceptual and also like fickle than the Greek gods. Like the Greek gods are like, they're just so like literal. They're, you know, they are they felt much more hands-on where the Romans are just more, more like amorphous concepts that people are trying to negotiate and navigate in order to like live their lives. Yes, I think that's absolutely fair. I mean, I know a lot less about, about the, the Greek gods, but also the Romans were always kind of like bunging in other people's gods into their own so you know they end up quite amorphous because they've adopted so many identities so Fortuna doesn't exactly marry up with TK the um, Greek goddess um, for instance you know who's who's very sort of associated with place in a way that Fortuna isn't so much for the Romans you know it's not like it's not like every place has a has a TK in, in quite in quite the same way I mean she does have some of those aspects but that's less uh, you know, what she was about. And there was also like a massive a, a temple to her. You know, they did have more hopeful um, signs of her. There was, you know, a temple to Fortuna the Hopeful um, near where I have Amara living with Demetrius um, in that district of Rome. That's not a temple that I have her visiting in the books, but I'm, I'm aware it was there. And there was also by the, the Circus Maximus, there was Fortuna Redux, who was you know, fortune who saves you from disasters. Um, so she has, yeah, she has many guises, but I would agree with you, there is this sense of, of fickleness and certainly the way that Pliny writes about her um, is, is, is as a terrifying force, this idea that, you know, right in the midst of joy, there's grief and after grief, there's joy. And that's also, you know, in the graffiti on Pompeii, um, the... I, I, some of the graffiti that I quote from in, in all three books actually refers to fortune, this idea that everything can collapse in an instant. It also just, just to connect her back to the Greek a little bit too, like TK is the goddess of fortune in Greek, but she's not really, she doesn't feel like as important. Like they didn't think about her that much. I don't think, you know, and, and yeah, she, she also, I think she, if I'm remembering correctly, she also mostly was popular or more popular in the east and in the hellenistic period yeah. so she's also like you know I, I mostly concern myself with the archaic and classical and it's like she doesn't even come up like i don't know the last time i have thought about her as a goddess so it's really just interesting to me to hear that there were so many temples in rome because she clearly held this relevance like they were much more interested and concerned by fortune definitely she's she's a very powerful force um and you know a lot of military men um you know like caesar like Pliny himself you know his his words on embarking on the rescue mission to vesuvius where fortune favors the brave um you know there's this this notion that you seize your destiny um amara in you know my fictional world talks to philos her lover in the second book about you know you, you can't wait for fortune's um bounty you have to seize her wheel and you know not demand it, but make your point very forcefully. <laughs> this idea that bravery, boldness, um, gumption is what gets you fortune's notice rather than just kind of begging her. It's really, it's just so interesting. I like, I obviously like the comparison because all my knowledge is Greek. So they just were <laughs> so different, but also like obviously quite similar in a lot of ways and they overlapped in such strong ways but it's just so fascinating to me the, the way the romans handled things like they just seem to be more and this is probably like way too broad of a statement but they just seem to be like darker people like they were just sort of more worried about everything or maybe just more like oh what's the word i want they were just more like um Oh, no, I'm not even going to think of a word. They just seem to be less, I want to say less fun, but that's that's my grief, my love of grace coming in. <laughs> no, I'm not going to allow you that. I think the they're really fun. <laughs> but they, they, they can be quite, they can come across quite sort of, um, yeah, quite dark, the Roman uh, conception of the gods, I would say, for sure. Yeah, it's just interesting in its own way, too. And I know they are still fun. I just, I love the Greeks. <laughs> So, I mean, I don't want to just shift directly into Vesuvius, but also I'm so I just I love the volcano of it all. Um, but I mean, 
when it comes to, I'm just trying to think of like the stuff that tends to be sort of most relevant to my audience, which is like the last book I remember, you know, you focus so much on, on like the festivals and those like really fascinating historical moments of Rome. And that's what I love. It's just like these, these little like insights into, you know, a fictionalized version of history. Um, obviously you have the volcano, which is very much going to be that in this book, but were there other things that you like cultural different things that you wanted to fit in? Yeah. So, I mean, Britannica is, is, is a major character in the series and, you know, her kind of role in life as a gladiator and how that fitted in, um, was really interesting to me. I'm not sort of a big, uh, gladiator fan. Um, you know, other writers have done that really well, kind of focusing on that aspect of Roman life and culture, but I do find female gladiators quite fascinating because they inhabit this place where they're both kind of a novelty act, almost to be laughed at. Um, you know, Domitian, uh, I think he had them fight people with dwarfism, um, you know, as part of his um, entertainment. So, you know, female gladiators could be... You, it's kind of doing something a bit outrageous. At the same time, uh, they did fight real fights, you know, like the guys in Ostia, for instance, we've got records of them having women putting other women to the sword, so fighting each other. And the way that uh, I imagine Britannica fitting into that um, life is really, she comes from a, a very warlike tradition, um, from the Iceni tribe in Britain. Uh, and so it's it's a way that she actually um, gets some respect for herself because she is she is very good at it. So that was interesting for me as well, because Amara is such a schemer and she's a, a pragmatist and she's had to kind of make her way as a sex worker and as a courtesan and as a kept mistress um, and sort of navigating life in that way. And Britannica, you know, again, uh, much like fortune favoring the brave, she's she's more of a Julius Caesar, <laughs> Pliny the Elder type character, and that you know she's she's a warrior basically. So I enjoyed looking at that aspect of life and of how she might or might not have gained the respect of fellow fighters as a woman in that world. So that was something that I enjoyed writing about. I did find it interesting. It's the first time that I've written in a Roman setting that's that's not Pompeii. Um, which I found very daunting. So the first chunk of the book is set in ancient Rome, um, where Amara is a courtesan to Demetrius, who's an imperial freedman. Um, and yeah, reimagining that city as opposed to a smaller town slash city um, on, in Campania, you know, in southern Italy. It's, it's not that Pompeii was a backwater, but it certainly wasn't the capital uh, that was really interesting to do, quite intimidating as well, <laughs> because it is Rome. Um, but I enjoyed sort of thinking about how the life might have been different there for Amara um, compared to compared to compared to Pompeii. Um, so that, yeah, I enjoyed that a lot in the research of of looking at the different places in Rome um, and the, the different decorations. It was quite interesting in terms of the frescoes how similar they were really across um Italy um and the empire more generally actually this this kind of artistic style the same myths come up over and over again on the walls Venus and Mars Hercules um you know the the whole story of Troy it's it's quite homogenous um so you know it's not a massive departure between Rome and Pompeii, but I found that very interesting to write about and the sort of power politics in, in the imperial palace. And then really with Vesuvius, I didn't want it to be a volcano book that ended with a volcano because how annoying for everyone, um, you know, just kill off all the characters. Um, so the volcano happens sort of halfway to, to sort of two thirds of the way through. And I really wanted to focus on what happened after the volcano as well, um, because, you know, not everybody died. Um, and it was a massive, massive upheaval in Roman life. You know, 
the emperor himself came to oversee and, and sort of check out the relief effort. Consuls, former consuls kind of oversaw it. It was there was a lot of financial um, support given to the region to rebuild it. So, yeah, that was that was an aspect of the Romans that I was really interested in, to be honest, um, how they how they cope with a natural disaster, how they looked after their people. Yeah, that was already going to be what I wanted to bring up next. Because that that's something I think that I personally have never really thought about when it comes to Pompeii, because it's just so interesting, you know, that it was preserved and we have yeah. this. But yeah, you have to imagine the surrounding area and how it would have affected them, both in terms of like the world, like the sky, all the different things that happen when a volcano erupts, but also, yeah, just taking care of the people and dealing with the aftermath completely. Um, do we have like records that we, yeah. we we do so not sort of vast details so we do have an incredibly detailed incredibly evocative account of the eruption itself um, given by Pliny the Elder's nephew Pliny the Younger writing about it many years later to um, the historian Tacitus who was a friend of his um, and so that was incredibly useful obviously for me writing it and in writing the disaster itself I wanted to Throughout the books, I've tried to have a bird's eye view, um, not bird's eye view, in fact, the opposite, I don't mean like bird's eye in the sense of hovering over things, the opposite, but really um, from the point of view of the characters who would not have much of a clue of what was going on, which is one of the reasons it's so frightening, just this stuff happening and, and you don't know why uh, or what's going to happen next. So that was what I wanted to capture within writing the eruption itself, just the absolute chaos and fear and horror of it, of being caught up in something you don't understand, but which you realize quite quickly is immense. Um, but in terms of the aftermath, so some of the Roman historians, so Suetonius and Cassius Dio, in that writing about the lives of the Caesars, they, um, they, they tell us some details about it that um, Titus, the emperor, visited a couple of times um, that the money of people who died in the eruption without air, that went so it was plowed back into the relief effort. It wasn't taken by the state. That there was this massive rebuilding project, mainly in Naples and um, uh, Neapolis, as it was then, and um, Putely, um, sort of big towns that weren't as affected. Um, but people would have been living in tents um, after the disaster, I imagine that the Roman army would have helped out with that um, because they they were very famous for their encampments that they were able to put up. You know, the fact that Pliny the Elder launched a rescue mission as well of the entire fleet across the bay shows that they were um, quite organized, really, when it came to um, acting quickly. Um, but the rebuilding of, of the area took you know, it took decades, it took a really long time. They didn't dig up the cities themselves. Um, they chose to rebuild in sort of newer sites, or rather, less affected towns. But I think another thing that, you know, maybe people aren't as aware of, but there were a lot of earthquakes at the time of the eruption. So even towns like Sorrentum, which which weren't right in the thick of it, um, that's modern day Sorrento, you know, they had major earthquake damage and there are inscriptions talking about Titus restoring the town clock, for instance, um, in Sorrentum. Um, and we've got in sort of grave inscriptions showing that people from Pompeii then went to Naples and their family name kind of continued in a new place. Um, also, a whole district of Naples was named after Herculaneum three centuries later, which suggests that the culture and the memory of of the dead towns continued okay i'm trying not to get too involved with how 
this part is clearly like the thing that connects with me most. I just I love thinking about volcanoes, but also this everything that comes around them is so interesting. So, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Of course, there would be lots of earthquakes, but, you know, it's so easy to focus on Pompeii as this place that was preserved in this fascinating way or completely, you know, to them, it completely decimated. Um but yeah, I mean, the the surrounding areas must have been so damaged. The earthquakes must have been very big if that is going off. And then do we know, like, how long? I mean, I just think of, like, you know, there's been other earthquakes where we know that, you know, there was, like, a, a volcanic winter or whatever, right? Like, there's, like, a year without sunlight. I don't think that Vesuvius would have caused well, that. Well, but... Apparently, it's, you know, it's it, it can be quite difficult to work out from some of the ancient sources. So for instance, Cassius Dio comes out with this idea that, you know, people were sitting in the theatre and were buried in ash, you know, all of a sudden in Pompeii. I mean, you know, Pliny the Younger is a reliable source. Aside from that, you know, people did quickly embellish what was going on. And even, even Pliny the Younger talks about, you know, people coming out with outlandish ideas at the time because it was just so vast and so scary so Cassius Dio does say that it darkened the sky over Rome that the the ash whether it it really did I I can't say but certainly um you know where I set the action it plenty of the younger talks about it being like snow drifts the ash like this filthy snow um and just the sense of the landscape being completely changed. It was an incredibly fertile part of the world, uh, you know, famous for, for, it, for its vineyards and its green slopes, Vesuvius. They didn't know it was a volcano, um, certainly not an active one. Even if people did know it had been a volcano in the past, they didn't know it was active. Um, and Marshall, the poet, writes about how it's just all been destroyed and it's this blackened desolate landscape um and that the gods themselves must wish that it hadn't been in their power to do this when they see what has happened to Campania so you know things that they don't necessarily write about in the sources but I just kind of made guesses on you know would they have had enough food they would have gone from being this producer of, of a lot of produce to somewhere that would have had to import um you know it would have been a terrible time for people but it would also have brought a lot of money in with infrastructure building you know building work always creates jobs creates business so it would have been a very strange time i think of both a lot of opportunity and a lot of hardship um which is often which is often what happens with these things. And, you know, I, I kind of imagine the different attitudes people would have had to the refugees. Some would have been very welcoming, some would not have been welcoming. Um, you know, money would have counted for everything, I think, in those situations, you know, who was able to who was able to make a new life for themselves would have would have depended on that. I guess it always does, but yeah, particularly then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, it it's just generally fascinating also i i think for the first time i'm gonna finally make it to pompeii in the winter oh wow and it's amazing i'm so excited i i haven't been to rome in like 12 years and i have never been to pompeii so i'm just you're getting me even more excited yeah oh, an incredible <laughs> place. and if you go go to the museum in naples first because a lot of the treasures from pompeii have have been you know either they were sort of stripped from the site by the earliest archaeologists who were, were pretty ham-fisted or they're kind of kept there to, to be preserved safely so it means you get such a sense of, of the site visually before you go there because a lot of Pompeii um, although it is incredibly preserved you know some of these spaces are quite empty um, all the frescoes are very faded so yeah going to Naples first really helps you visualize it yeah that's that's good to know it makes me think last year I went to Santorini for the first time and visited Akrotiri, but then they also, they've done something similar, which is that in, in Thera, um, they have moved a lot of the wall paintings and stuff that were preserved, you know, with that volcano um, yeah. and having that, like the, the both pieces in your mind makes a really big difference in understanding. It yes, all. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I know you focused on so much in the first two books uh, was like what we can learn both the like everyday and, you know, much more intricate 
the, um, the things we can learn from Pompeii graffiti. So did that play as big a role in this one? Did you Were you having some fun with that as well? So the graffiti, yeah, I mean, the, the thing that's so tragic is that obviously, you know, after a certain point, the graffiti is, it stopped and nobody wrote about the volcano in Pompeii because <laughs> there was nobody there to write about it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I continued to kind of think about, I guess, you know, some of the things that I find quite poignant are people's hopes for the future that they wrote about in Pompeii um, and Herculaneum. So that that certainly plays a role. I mean, in terms of the inscriptions at the beginning of, of chapter headings, so the wolf den was very kind of graffiti heavy um, because it was looking at that side of life. And then in the House of the Golden Door, it, it moved to sort of writings about um, about it, what it meant to be enslaved, really. Um, and I guess, you know, with the Temple of Fortuna, it's it's the first time that Amara's world is very much connected to bigger um, events. So there's a lot of the Roman historians. There's obviously the Plinies, both Plinies this time. Um, Livy as well. And Pliny the Younger was reading Livy um, during the eruption. Um, and, you know, Livy is a very kind of serious historian writing about big events. So, again, I guess in terms of the text, that I was thinking about for this one, there's a real mixture between quite sort of vulnerable, deeply personal graffiti about people's hopes for their family life, mm-hmm. sort of interspersed with these very heavy um, sort of political uh, power musings by sort of powerful men. Mm-hmm. Well, especially if you're, you know, if you're setting so much at the beginning, at least in Rome as well, like I imagine mm-hmm. that would really come into play. Yeah, so it, the beginning section in Rome, you know, Amara's a courtesan. Um, her patron is is Demetrius, and a, a fictional imperial freedman. But you know, like the actual imperial freedman, his his life is very tied to the emperor he serves, which was Vespasian. And then it, it, the book opens shortly after the death of Vespasian, um, and so he serves um, Titus, who he's very close to, who Pliny the Elder was also very close to. Um, But Domitian is a kind of um, menacing presence in the background. So one of the things that I I really wondered about doing an afterword or not about is, so Demetrius's fortune is very tied up with with Titus, who was emperor, um, and who had a very difficult relationship with his brother Domitian, who succeeded him. I mean, you know, people rumoured that Domitian bumped his brother off. I don't think there's huge evidence for that, but certainly he wasn't. He wasn't mourning his brother's death too much. Um, you know, he was barely dead before he was <laughs> claiming uh, his imperial role. That death of Titus takes place after the end of the book, but would have ramifications for the choices that characters make within it. So that was kind of a continuation of Fortuna and how you can't second guess her in a way. Mm. Yeah. Is that, this is my, my, might just cut this out. Is that near around the time when there were just like the so many emperors back to back and like. That was, no. that was, that was Vespasian. Uh, so yes, in the sense, but that had happened previously. That had happened about a decade before. Okay. So not yeah. that long though. Cause no, they've been no, <laughs> no. And that's, so the fact there'd been this massive upheaval um, at the end of Nero's reign um, and Vespasian had been a Roman commander who kind of took power he wasn't connected um you know to a line of succession not that they really had a line of succession as such but you know still he was an outsider who kind of had to fight for power um and that's very much in the minds of Demetrius and Pliny the Elder and Amara at the start of the book as is this going to be a peaceful transition of power you know it's it's quite it's quite a tense moment um the sort of handover from one emperor to another well, and I didn't realize that that would have happened so close to the eruption, too. Yeah. So- Titus had barely been emperor before it erupted. And I mean, I opted for the October date, which is is the more generally accepted one. But, you know, it might have been in the August, in which case it, even closer to him taking over from his his father who died, you know, in June, uh, I think late June, early July. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. And so the reason I even, you know, brought up the 
the Nero period and preceding him is, I don't think about Rome all that often, but I have been reading Seneca lately um, yeah. and two of his tragedies. And I know, you know, he lived through most of that and into Nero. Um, so it's, like, it's also like my main frame of reference right now in Rome, which is <laughs> not saying a lot, um, but it's interesting just the, the, all the turnover that has happened at different periods in, in terms of Roman emperors is interesting because it would have just affected so much. And then, yeah, you add a, a volcanic eruption that nobody saw coming and that changed like the whole of the country. I can only imagine, you know, what would go down. Well, it would, I mean, if you think about it, you know, even if you'd never been to Pompeii, but you, you were living in Italy um, or even, you know, further afield in the, in the Roman empire, you know, the, the obliteration of, a number of towns is is deeply shocking it would have been a profound trauma for everybody even if they didn't have a direct direct connection with it i mean in the wolf den the sort of rome the emperor all of this it, it's kind of so distant from amara's life it's barely something she even thinks about she doesn't think about the politics at all like why would she it's no no impact to her life whatsoever Whereas by the Temple of Fortuna, you know, it has a very di direct impact on her life. She's actually meeting with these people, um, you know, not she's still very on the periphery, but, you know, she has she knows who they are. You know, her her um, partner or patron, however we want to think about Demetrius, he's a kind of ambiguous figure for her. You know, he's very close to Titus, as is Pliny the Elder. And even though she's not close to the emperor, um, she is close to Pliny and Demetrius so it's 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 the sense that she's moved quite close to power which is which is a dangerous place to be much like being close to a volcano because it's very unpredictable could it erupt at any moment yeah especially when you have that uh, such a recent example of of those things kind of happening like if, if yes. Nero was only 10 years before and, and you know it's, there's a lot to kind of fear and a volcano too like it, I mean, as much as, yeah, it, just the, the towns getting destroyed would obviously be a traumatic event for the whole region, but also just the, the actual natural things that happen and go so much farther than Pompeii. Um, yeah, like, you know, whether Rome got darkened, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. It depends on the volcano, but like you can, they darken the sky for so far, you know? Um, and even like there was a big fire in Rome. I mean, Titus actually had to leave the disaster site at Pompeii to return to Rome, where there was a big fire. I didn't go into that in the book, but you know, it was a pretty, pretty grim old time for, for, uh, for Titus and and his, you know, the people at that time. But yeah, yeah, brand new emperor, and you're dealing with all of that. All That's these, all these massive crises, you know, just like yeah, like a yeah. U.S. president coming in and dealing with multiple multiple natural disasters and political crises all at once. Yeah. This is very peripheral, but just like oddly on my mind. But um, I think it was on the weekend on Sunday. Um, we had a, vol or a volcano. We had an earthquake here, not a volcano. It was just a tiny earthquake, but it's the first one that I've like felt in a long time. Like we get them all the time, but you don't feel them. And I actually like felt it. And it was just this little thing. But I just I can have a more visceral idea of like what that would be like, because even just the earthquakes farther away, like your whole world is shaking the sky probably gets dark and then these cities get destroyed and you're just kind of left wondering, you know, everything. So it's just, I mean, I think it's also the perfect time for, to set a book because you just have so many different things that you can play with and, and have your characters dealing with. I don't want to like spoil it by asking questions about too much after the volcano, since that's towards the end of the book. Um, but I just, yeah, it must, it must have been really interesting to be able it, to play with all it that. Was. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's quite sad and quite sad as an understatement. You know, one of the things that characters who survive have to grapple with is, is the grief, not only of people they've lost, but also the place, just the strangeness that you, 
you know, the, the place that you've called home, the streets that you've walked no longer exist. Um, I mean, we don't know how much salvaging went on. We, a lot of the marble, for instance, was taken from the forum and the theatre. When that was done, you know, it might have been done quite immediately as part of the relief effort. That's certainly how I imagined it, the idea that bits of Pompeii were turning up in Naples or wherever um, as part of the rebuilding. You know, the Romans were fairly unsentimental about reusing material. And people did try to tunnel back into Pompeii um, to salvage. Whether it was people very close to the eruption trying to get back in to get their stuff, uh, we also know that, uh, uh, and maybe it was kind of concerted as part of the relief effort, was it the army? We also know that thieves tried to get in. Um, there are kind of holes in the wall where it says house tunneled through as a message. Was that a message by people, you know, who were part of the official relief effort or was that kind of bandits, you know, roaming around, leaving each other messages as to where it was worth going, where wasn't? And some of the um, human remains that are in Pompeii, we don't actually know if they are people who died in the eruption or people who died trying to get back into Pompeii after the eruption, you know, because it was pretty dangerous to be tunneling in um, to a buried city. Yeah, yeah, there's just, it's just so unimaginable until you have to imagine it, I guess. But it's, mm -hmm. it, it's one of those things that I think you can never fully understand what what it would be like unless no. you're actually living through it. And, and, and I set it safely, you know, a couple of millennia in the past, you know, it's not nice to think of these things happening now. I, I, I think I, you know, I felt able to write about it because it was so long ago, which is not to say that people's lives then didn't matter, but it did feel, I think with a lot of these things, like writing about um, the ancient world, you know, it's, they're very similar to us. They're also very, very different. And they were a very, very long time ago. Um, and so I think I feel able to sort of reimagine these things in a way that I, I really wouldn't with something more recent. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a level of disconnect where you can appreciate what the very real people would have gone through yes. without... Yeah, without feeling bad for using it or, or you know, or even like someone like me finding entertainment in, not even entertainment, just like I'm fascinated by the volcano. And, you know, it, it that would, I mean, I might be fascinated, but I would also be like horrified for something that's happening now versus, yeah, yeah. 2000 years ago. I think, I think there's that. I mean, I think as well, for me, I had a very strange relationship with knowing I was going to write about the volcano. So in the Wolf Den, I literally didn't think of it at all because, for me, I, what interests me about Pompeii is, is a, the living city as it was, the fact that it's so incredibly preserved and thinking about ordinary people's lives. And I almost didn't want to write about the volcano at all, but I did think you cannot write a trilogy about Pompeii and not have the volcano. It'd be just strange. Um, so, yeah, because it is so much part of the story. Um, but that was always what fascinated me. So in the first book, there are, I don't think there's any you know minimal references to Vesuvius I didn't want it kind of looming around like a kind of foreshadow of doom um because the characters wouldn't have seen it that way it was just a mountain you know the most they would have thought was all the wine that was growing on its slopes um and the fact that it looked blue or whatever so in the second book you know there are a few more earthquakes uh and just you, you're vaguely aware of it and I mentioned Vesuvius a few more times but again not in an ominous way um, and so I kind of almost forgot about it writing both those two books and then I really had to think about it in the third one um, so in some ways I kind of wrote about the volcano I thought I would be quite reluctant to write about the volcano but then in the end it 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 actually felt right for that to be the topic of, of the book and to be part of because it fitted into as well, or fitted in it's the wrong phrase, but it was also part of the wider story arcs of all the characters of how how to make your fortune in a very uncertain, brutal, um, violent world. Yeah, I mean it 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 seems to suit very perfectly this idea of fortune, the good and the bad, and and the the way people can have absolutely no control you know yes. uh, of their lives but even as far as yeah living through a volcano but that reminds me um one thing I 
thought to mention earlier and then forgot. So thank you. Um, but the, the thing about Pompeii that makes it you know, the living city, like you said, you know, it, it is so completely preserved from exactly this time period. And so we can see exactly what it was like, you know, in 79 CE and the, but then, you know, you, you're writing about Rome, which is so different, which is so mm -hmm. It, it obviously, you know, archaeologists have done so much work so that we have an idea of what it would have been like at certain time periods. But it, you know, it, it's like Greece to me, where it's you, you're never totally sure where something is coming from unless you're, you know, doing absolute in depth research. But one of the things that's come up for me recently is r learning or realizing, you know, how, how much of certain aspects of, of Greek archaeology were completely influenced by the Romans and it didn't look like that before the Romans came in, you know. And so when you're working with Rome, oh my gosh, the theaters specifically, just to share this, especially because we talked about gladiators earlier, but I learned that a, most of, well, a lot of the surviving theaters that we have, they have this wall around, like just in front of the seats. And that was in complete uh, Roman period intervention because they were doing gladiator fights in there. Um, but a lot of the time you think of it as being, that's just what a theater looked like, but no, the Romans put that in for protection because they had gladiators in a regular theater. That's interesting. I had no idea. Yeah. Just how, well, even in Pompeii, to be honest, we don't know sometimes what time period graffiti belongs to, or, you know, that the house of the fawn, for instance, uh, was it, it was in what would have by then have been like a very antique style, you know, several hundred years old, some of, some of the stuff in there, the famous um, mosaic of Alexander and Darius. Um, mm. You know, the, these were already quite old by the time of the eruption. So Pompeii is kind of like an interrupted city and it's hard to know always exactly what time frames we're looking at. Um, you know, one, one of the examples is we often have, people talking about at the um, suburban baths, the the lockers that are, that are distinguished by very explicit sexual scenes, you know, different types of sexual acts taking place um, above each each locker. And it's kind of like, oh, wow, you know, that's, that's what they were doing. But in fact, by the time of the eruption, these have been painted over. So I certainly, when I was writing Pompeii, I did make a choice. Uh, and we don't know, for instance, you know, I, I made a choice to use some of the material that might have been older, but do it as if it was it was contemporary to when I was writing. You know, another thing that we just don't know is how much building work was going on from the earthquake um, in in the 60s uh, that took place in the 60s AD. AD. Uh, you know, some people feel like the town was already quite uh, damaged. Some people feel like the building work had been largely completed. I chose to go with it had been largely completed. Um, you know, the Temple of Venus was that in, in a state of disarray because salvagers after the eruption plundered the marble or was it, you know, kind of ruined at the time of the eruption. So even though we think of Pompeii as this place frozen in time, actually, you know, even that is is quite uncertain, some of these things. I made and some of the choices I made, such as the fact that I had the baths reopened and working, was purely for my own benefit in writing the story. <laughs> so yeah. That's the fun of fiction too, right? Like, yeah, exactly. You, yeah. You get to work with history, but also make the choices that you want because it suits your story and you want to. I'm really unapologetic about it, to be honest, because I, I take the research incredibly seriously. You know, I, I'm very passionate about the ancient world. I've read a lot of classical authors. I've done a lot of research on Pompeii specifically. But then at the end of the day, I'm not a historian. Um, and, you know, you make you make your choices. Uh, so, for instance, you know, after the eruption, the details of exactly how that relief effort happened was quite sketchy. Um, if the army did go in and build refugee camps speedily, probably not as speedily as I imagine them doing it, um, but if they did, the location of those camps would likely have been different to where I imagined it. But, you know, I wanted to put the camp there for specific kind of narrative reasons. And, um, yeah, I think that's that's part of the joy of, of writing fiction. I remember talking to Mary Beard uh, about this once. Um, when I was lucky enough to interview her and um, 
she was saying that she thinks fiction and the ancient world is, is kind of ideally suited because there are so many gaps uh, that, you know, when you're writing nonfiction, you just have to say, we don't know, or here's a gap. Whereas in fiction, you are allowed to fill it. Yeah, well, that's the fun of all of it. I mean, I think about that with myth all the time because mm -hmm. the gaps we have are enormous and they're often like this in just huge question mark that everyone wants the answer to. So yeah, I mean, fiction's so fun for that. And I think, yeah, I, yeah, the, I love the idea of of historical fiction to the degree that you've done it, which is that you can get a real sense of Pompeii, but also know you're reading fiction. But, you know, I think it, like the depth of research really shows and yeah, the nerd in me appreciates it. It's why you come on the show. That's for sure. <laughs> like we can talk about history and the book. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm a massive nerd. I, I could bore on about Pompeii. Um, very long time. <laughs> I mean, I can do that about a lot of things. So I do, I identify with that. Yeah, I, it, that's the fun of being a nerd though, is having all of these things. It is. I mean, for, for the next writing project, it, you know, part, it's largely set in Roman Britain and that's been quite strange leaving that part of the world. Although, you know, it's going to be in, set in Italy as well as, as Roman Britain. I couldn't quite leave Italy mind. <laughs> Um, yeah, just sort of these, the different things that remain, the different artifacts, the different texts, I just, it's so fascinating, um, reading and the visual side of it, and then trying to reimagine it. I think one of the things I try to do most in my writing is not be too, uh, anachronistic in the ways that people think about life. So, you know, writing, trying to reimagine the lives of enslaved people for instance you know not having people think of a system of emancipation or a sort of a worldview that we have now of slavery is inherently wrong um they just didn't have that worldview so although people resisted slavery it was it was from a different basis that they personally didn't want to be enslaved as opposed to it's simply wrong to enslave anybody yeah i mean yeah, I think it's it's very important to to see those things in the ancient world because I mean as, across the ancient world it's applicable, and of course the people in it don't want it. But yeah, I mean it would be nice if there had been some big <laughs> emancipation movement. Not least because I just think it would be an interesting thing to read about very, in the ancient world. Yeah, I mean some some writers like Seneca you mentioned earlier, you know they they were more humane about it but it's still you know there's still not you know in that they were quite sympathetic about slaves enslaved people who were ill-treated but they're still not questioning their right to have enslaved people that they own yeah. um you know and Amara who hates being enslaved and fights so ferociously to gain her freedom goes on to own people because that's what freed people did um so yeah. I, I didn't want to make her like some anachronistic character who somehow got that it was wrong to own other people because she'd been owned so yeah yeah I mean there's a there's a very big difference between being sympathetic to an individual person or group of people's plight and actually like trying to find a way out of it as a systemic thing in your world like, yes yeah well I mean we can see you know there are things in our own time you know like homelessness for instance you know however much people think homelessness is, is wrong and they have sympathy for people who are homeless you know all of us have walked past a homeless person sleeping on the street you know it, it's part of the world we inhabit and I think when we're inclined to be quite judgmental about the ancient world it's not to gloss over the horrors but it's to understand that there are horrors in our own world too that we perhaps don't see as clearly as maybe people in the future will yes yeah, that's, I think that's a very good way of saying it too. I think of also just like the super rich and the way we all just kind of accept that there are people who could solve homelessness, but they don't. And we're just, you know, the rest of us just have to to sit back and, and know that that's a thing. You know, there's there's so many different issues like that. And it's so easy to look back. That's very Roman as well, really, mm. you know, the massive discrepancy in wealth. I don't think there's ever been a time in human history where we didn't just kind of accept that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as soon as the invention of money happened, I think that that became a very real thing. And of course, it's also 
particularly in the ancient world, inherently tied to slavery, right? Like it, yeah, it's, it's only the past few hundred years where discrepancies of wealth haven't also resulted in that. Of course, like, you know, there's very different types of slavery, but certainly in the ancient world, that was just tied to that. I mean, you could just get poor enough that you became enslaved. Exactly. Yes, it was something, it was a sort of form of bad luck that could happen to anyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Now I'm <laughs> trying to think of a, a a lighter topic that we can <laughs> agree about something lighter to end on. Um, yeah. No, I agree with you. Um, I'm trying to think. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's not the lightest book uh, because obviously the volcano goes off. But I mean, it's it's also a vengeance saga. I think people will be quite satisfied by how that goes. Um, And it's about, I suppose it's the hopeful, okay, yeah. So I guess the hope in this book comes from, as I was explaining earlier, that the the period after the volcano, although it was horrific um, and very difficult, was also a time of renewal, of people reinventing themselves, of just the sense of survival. So Amara, the main character in the series, is very much a survivor. Um, in in her sort of attitude to life uh, as is Britannica as is a number of the characters Um, and so I think it's also you know thinking about the human spirit about what really matters uh, about to people um, to all of us uh, when we're faced with extraordinary circumstances you know it's in the end it's the people we love Um, it's you know what really matters to us in life. So I think that the Temple of Fortuna is also looking at that. So what, what it means to live a fulfilling life in the face of something, you know, as terrifying as Vesuvius. Well, I mean, all of this conversation has just uh, made me even more excited to read it. Um, <laughs> one of the things I said off mic, I think, but this is the first time uh, of, that one of your books, I haven't had a chance to read it before talking to you, but I'm I'm not glad. I'm almost glad because I think you've made me more keen, not least because you've referenced all these things that I remember from the first two. And I'm like, oh, right. I'd forgotten about that. We get to return to these people like I'd forgotten about Britannica. And it's like, oh, that's the best part about going back to a series, you know, when the final one does come out is also remembering all the things that you forgot and then getting excited about them again. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, I recap things, I hope, subtly in the book. And, you know, a few people have read this uh, on NetGalley, you know, without having read the other two um, and, you know, found it work fine as a standalone. I would recommend anyone reading this book really to get the most benefit out of it. I think it's better to read it as a series. But it is also, you know, I did write it as a book. I wrote all three books, actually, as that they could be self-contained. You could start with any of them. Um But obviously, I recommend people buy all three and start at the beginning. (laughs) Of course. No, I remember that from also just picking up the second one when it had been like a year or more since I had read the first one. And yeah, not feeling like I had to go back and reread it to remember. Definitely not. No, I mean, I've I've explained things and pick up and, you know, I don't think anyone's going to have difficulty that way. Um, You know, you could read it not having read either of the other two. So. That's interesting too that you've had people say that. That's that's very flattering also to to have people happy with it by itself. Well, I I mean I've definitely done that with books that were linked before like inadvertently picked up one in a series and actually it worked in a really interesting way on its own. Um so yeah, I mean I always aimed to do that. The next book I'm writing is not part of a series. It's a standalone because I I think I did discover that, that there's a real joy in writing a series and that the world building, you know, there's the opportunity to make it incredibly rich. Uh, and obviously the research carries through and you just build on it throughout the series. And it's, there's a joy in, in really inhabiting those characters and developing them. Um, but I think the sort of narrative challenge of carrying multiple story arcs, like a revenge arc, a love arc, all these different story arcs across um, multiple books, I'm quite looking forward to writing a standalone where it's all self-contained. <laughs> I can imagine because like all the arcs of Amara, yes, but you also had so many characters on the periphery 
that had really important things yeah. going on. Like you really did, yeah, introduce a lot of stories that then you had to keep <laughs> picking up and finish. And yeah, I can yeah. I imagine a standalone would be very nice. Yes. Yeah. So that's that that one I'm writing is Boudicca's daughter. So it's Ooh. set it's set and in fact Britannica has a cameo in it as a child. Um yeah. So it's set in the reign of Nero, in fact. So before, you know, good decade or more before the events of the first book in the Wolfden trilogy. That'll be I mean I'm I'm excited already. I don't know anything about Boudicca except what I have like seen people say over the years very haphazardly. But I just like the idea of a woman doing something that sounds badass from what little I know. So. <laughs> yeah, she's a fascinating character. I mean the book focuses less on her and more on 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 her her children but um but yeah I mean she is an extraordinary historical figure Mm -hmm. yeah but yeah is there um something you want to share with my followers in terms of following you anywhere or learning more or obviously you know buying the book but yeah um so if people are interested in in the Wolf Den trilogy it is out the first two books are already out in the UK and US and then the Temple of Fortuna the final book is out on the 9th of November in the UK and on the 14th of November in the US um, and I am online on Instagram as Elodie L. Harper. And also um, I have a blog uh, and various other things at my website, elodieharper.com. Um, the blog's all about Pompeii and Romans and nerdy stuff. It's not kind of me blogging about my life. So <laughs> if you're interested in, in that kind of stuff of, of Pompeii and um, some of the things on the podcast, there's a little bit more about it on there. Wonderful. Um, and this episode will come out on the 10th of November, I believe, unless something weird happens where it can't. Um, so the book will be out in the UK and coming out on the next Tuesday. By the time people have listened to this, it'll be perfect. Or in North America, the Tuesday. Yay, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for doing this. It's, oh, it's so lovely to talk to you yes, every time. such a joy. I just have such happy memories of our first podcast and then, you know, then catching up. I, you know, and I really hope you will... Um, look me up if you come to the UK because it would just be so much fun like we could go nerd out over the statues in the British Museum it would be brilliant and have dinner I (laughs) I would love all of that absolutely definitely go for drinks (laughs) hell yeah Uh, As always, thank you, nerds, for listening. I love speaking with Elodie, and it's just utterly so fascinating learning this much about Rome and their culture and all of these things that are not war, which I think is what Rome gets thought of so often, which is also why that I have, you know, I've always sort of aimed towards Greece, not that they didn't do that. Uh, But, you know, just these bits about Rome that are just so normal and everyday and the way these people would have lived utterly fascinating. So, you know, for the third time, huge thanks to Elodie for speaking with me. We always have such a fun chat. And thank you all for listening. And once again, uh, I'm just going to keep this short and sweet. But we're going to read the credits because I'm feeling a little bit better. (laughs) Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians. She does everything. She's the best. She is more appropriately known as my assistant producer. I am newly working with Laura, who again, I need to get her permission before I keep saying more, but who is working on some audio editing for me. Oh my God, guys, (laughs) what a thrill. It's almost like I've been doing this for six years and should have taken on more people earlier. The podcast is hosted and monetized by iHeartMedia. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron where you will get bonus episodes and more. Visit patreon.com or click the link in this episode's description. Thank you all. You're the best. I am Liv and I, I love this shit. (laughs) 